<clears throat> Welcome to the First Coast Free Thought Society Zoom Room. Uh, today is President's Day, originally established in 1885 in recognition of President George Washington. It became known as President's Day after his commemoration was moved as part of the 1971 Uniform Monday Holiday Act, an attempt to create more three-day weekends, now largely marked by retail sales from Walmart to the Wall Street Journal. Also in February, Charles Darwin was born on February 12, 1809. February 3, 1817, the Fifteenth Amendment was ratified, guaranteeing the right of citizens to vote regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The First Coast Free Thought Society is an organization of individuals who prefer science and reason over religious dogma and fanaticism. We've enjoyed the non-religious population of Northeast Florida since 1998. We are now in our 25th year. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Meetup, Instagram, and YouTube. We have Secular Sunday in the Park, book and movie discussion groups, the free thinker newsletter to which we invite your submissions. Our website is firstcoastfreethoughtsociety.org or fcfs.org. Now, I have a question for everybody before we get rolling further. Is anyone here new to the First Coast Free Thought Society? Is this your first time meeting with us? And if so, are you willing to raise your hand and say yes? Because if you are, I have another question. I have a follow-up. Oh, good for you, Jack. Uh, and I see Mag Maggie Anders, anybody else? Um, are you willing to share with us? How did you hear about us? How did you learn that we had a meeting tonight? You can unmute yourselves and, and answer answer if, you, if you're interested. I found it on Meetup. You found it on Meetup? Uh, were you looking for something specific or were you looking for how did you find it on meetup i may have typed in nasa i don't i'm not sure okay Mars or something yeah thank you meetup good would you care to share maggie unmute yourself if you are okay am i unmuted yes you are Okay, um, I saw it on Facebook. On Facebook, okay. Thank you. And and it was the topic that it interested you, I suppose, correct? Yes. Very good. And my grandson is also gonna watch with us. Oh, very good. What's your name? Elliot. Elliot, nice to meet you, Elliot. I'm Ken. Uh, thank you. Anybody else care to share? Uh, Adrian wanted to. I did. I was the first one. Oh, yes. Adrian did already. Thank you. Um, thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Maggie. Appreciate it. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, we are all volunteers, yet we do incur some expenses, largely for promotion. We promote it online, on the radio, and in print. And if you know of a viable place for us to promote, please share it with us. We also have some associated costs for our website and fees for regulatory compliance as a 501c3 educational charitable organization. So if you can see your way clear to offer a membership donation of 20, 50, or any dollar amount, you'll be part of the reason we are able to continue our public outreach. We are tremendously grateful for all who have become members and for your donations. We appreciate you, we need you. As a reminder, do, the membership dues are good for the calendar year. February is Black History Month. So next month, March, Monday, March 20th, we will enjoy the expertise of a local civil rights activist, Black historian and author, Rodney L. Hurst Sr., who wrote, it was never about a hot dog and a Coke, a personal account of Axe Handle Saturday and the 1960 sit-in demonstrations in Jacksonville. He also wrote, unless we tell it, it never gets told. And another book that he wrote, Never Forget Who You Are, Conversations About Racism and Identity Development. That's Monday evening, March 20th. Other upcoming guest speakers we can look forward to include Mandisa Thomas, founder and president of Black, president of Black Nonbelievers Incorporated, Rob Boston from Americans United for Separation of Church and State, from the Innocence Project, Brandon Sheck, 
Dr. Nick Seabrook, political science and public administration chair and professor at UNF, who will discuss his book, One Person, One Vote, A Surprising History of Gerrymandering in America. Check your local listings, sign on to Meetup, sign up for our newsletter and our email announcements and stay informed what we're doing. Now, tonight, this is the good stuff. Tonight, we're all here for a great presentation. We're delighted to welcome astrophysicist and UNF associate, associate professor, Dr. Jack Hewitt, whose interests include, but are not limited to, energetic processes that occur in the Milky Way and nearby galaxies and the acceleration and propagation of cosmic rays, which thrive chemistry in interstellar clouds. He's also studying the unique environment our galaxies at our galaxy's center, which hosts the highest density of massive stars and black holes. As if that's not enough, Jack is here tonight to give us the latest about the James Webb Telescope and its findings and answer the question, can the Webb Telescope take a selfie? There will be plenty of time for Q&A discussion. Should you prefer, you may message a question or a comment via the Zoom chat. Let's mute our mics until you're speaking. Please know we are recording for this presentation for posterity. So now let's enjoy the time, the expertise, the insights graciously offered to us by Dr. Jack Hewitt. Jack, we are all yours. Unmute your mic, Jack. Thank you so much, Ken. That was a fantastic introduction. Well, I'm really happy to be here um, to talk about this amazing telescope. And thank you so much. Um, I think David Schwambert, thank you for letting me know about the First Coast Free Thought Society. And You're welcome. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah. So it's it's hard to believe, but it's been over a year since we've had this amazing telescope in space. Um, hopefully you can see it here. This is obviously not a real picture, um, but the James Webb Space Telescope is there and it's um, was launched on Christmas Day in 2021. And all the astronomers held their breath because it cost $10 billion to make this telescope, which is a lot of money. I don't think anyone would argue with that. It, it was about half of NASA's total budget for astrophysics for more than a decade. So it took a long time to spend all this money. And most of the money did not go to astronomers. It went to the engineers that built this um, this really remarkable telescope. Just to put that in in context, though, uh, you know, ten billion dollars is a lot of money. But during the time that they've been building the James Webb Space Telescope, the U.S. government has spent about ten thousand times more on its budget. So this is a small amount, you know, one ten thousandth of your taxes, right? Um, and so it better be really good. And we've had it for a year, and already I think it's been fantastic. So I wanted to tell you about this, but I also wanted to plug my astronomy nights. Um, this is very similar to the talk I gave, uh, let's see, a couple weeks ago. And uh, we have them once a month, the first Friday of every month. We go up to the roof and we, we do stargazing from UNF's campus, um, and there's always a public talk. And actually, there's there's an astronomy night coming up this Friday that I haven't announced yet. So you're the first to hear about it. It's going to be there's a visiting uh, professor coming from, I think, USF. And he knows all about phosphorus and meteors and how that may be responsible for life on Earth. And so he's going to talk uh, about his research into phosphorus and, and the origins of life. Um, so there's info there. And I put it in the chat window. The James Webb Space Telescope, this is a picture from, I don't know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, before I came to UNF in 2015, I was a postdoc at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, which basically meant that was a short-term position, you know, freshly minted PhD. And I was working on other things, not, not, not the James Webb Space Telescope, but I was at you know, Goddard Space Flight Center, which is right outside DC. And during the time they were actually putting the telescope together, so I got to go, not in the clean room, but there's a little window in the background where I got to go and stand and watch them put it together during my lunch breaks. Um, this gives you a sense of scale for how big this telescope is. And this is truly remarkable. Oh, sorry, someone has a question in the chat about if I need to be a student. No, anyone can come to astronomy nights. Actually, the students help run astronomy nights. So it's totally open to anyone. The parking's free, and it's right there by, by where we have them. 
Um, and I saw several people from NIFIS, uh, which is our local astronomical society, they put out some really great um, stargazing astronomy public events as well, um, like at Hannah Park. Uh, so I'm sure you could ask in the chat window about those. There's lots of great public astronomy events um, around Jacksonville. So I got to see them doing this. Um, and so I was really excited when it was time to launch. Let's see. Uh, just to explain why we needed this brand new $10 billion telescope, it does, it better do something that's never been done before. And it does. Um, if you think about the Hubble Space Telescope, which you know was launched what uh 30 years ago almost this looked at mostly visible light and a little bit of infrared um you know sort of the infrared you could see with an infrared gamma the james webb space telescope sees just a little bit in our visible range just a little bit in the red like the reddest red you could see but then it goes to these really long infrared wavelengths and so it's looking at things that are at cooler temperatures um, not necessarily the temperatures of stars, right? The star like our sun creates visible light. Cooler things will create infrared light. And so this is what the James Webb Space Telescope is really looking at is like dust and gas in, in our galaxy and in other galaxies. Um, but also it looks at stars that are really far away, so far away that they've been redshifted by the expansion of space. So what was used to be visible light because they're traveling so far away from us due to the expansion of space, it's shifted into the infrared. And so the first stars and the first galaxies that ever formed, we can see in the infrared, but we haven't seen them yet. We needed a really, really big telescope in space to be able to see this. So that was the main motivation for, for uh, JWST. And which was why in the 1990s, astronomers said, this is our top priority and we're gonna spend, it'll be like one or $2 billion. And then when the engineers got their hands on it, it got more and more complicated and more and more expensive to build to the astronomer specifications. And so we ended up with this giant unfolding origami telescope. But here you can see, like this is the progression of infrared space telescopes. Before JWST, our view of the universe in the infrared was very blurry. Um, we just weren't able to build really large telescopes and launch them into space. The mirror for the James Webb Space Telescope is about what six and a half meters, or sorry, eight meters. And so this telescope is enormous, and it actually didn't fit in the rocket. It had to be folded up and launched into space and then unfurled as it um, traveled to where it's orbiting now. So it's orbiting at a point called L2, which is opposite the Earth from the sun. So it's always staying on the far side of Earth from the sun, right, the night side. And it has this kind of strange orbit in order to cool down. Um, the Earth, like we emit an infrared, the Earth emits an infrared, even the sun is very bright in the infrared. And so the James Webb Space Telescope has a really, really large multi-layered sun shield to keep it cool. Now it's in space, so you would think it would be very cold, but if there's light shining on it, it will heat up and it doesn't have any air around it to sort of heat up and carry away the heat. And so uh, engineers needed to build something that's roughly the size of two tennis courts um, to block light and keep the telescope cool. And so because it's so cold, it can actually see things. Um, if it were not cooled down, the telescope would actually be the brightest source. It would be far brighter than any of the stars that it's trying to look at. So you can see the it's about one and a half million miles or kilometers from Earth and, and kind of stays there and will stay there for however long we can operate it in space. All right, um, I'm sure you wanted to see the pretty pictures. Well, this is the first sort of image that, that the James Webb Space Telescope took. This was, um, I think it was in June or April of 2022. And at this point, they're still trying to align the telescope. And still, so there's all these hexagonal mirrors that fit together to make a larger mirror to collect infrared light. And these mirrors are actually coated in um, beryllium and gold to be more reflective in the infrared. That's why it has that like gold color. Well, when it first unfurled, it was not quite collimated. It wasn't putting the light in the proper place. What should have been one star, you can see on the left here, ended up being almost like 18 different stars. 
Um, there's actually a small camera. There's not really a camera to see the telescope in space, although that would have been cool. Uh, but there is a, a small camera to sort of see what the mirror looks like. So if there was a catastrophic like impact on the mirror or some engineering failure, they could take a, uh, an image of it. So there is a selfie camera. Um, and this is the first selfie that they took. And you can see it's reflecting. One of those panels is really bright because it's a little bit off calibration. And so it's reflecting that bright starlight. To give you a sense of scale, not that we're going to send uh, astronauts to the telescope, but if you did, this is roughly how big a person would be next to this amazing telescope. Um, when they aligned the telescope, this is what they saw. That star that had been all those different stars scattered around came into this perfect alignment and created this bright star. And now you can see all these fainter objects behind it. And anything that has that cross, those spiky patterns, those are diffraction spikes. And so that's how you know it's a star. It's a point of light. And no matter how much we magnify it, it's still going to be a tiny point of light. So it, this was fantastic. Like the first image, everything was working. It was just as they planned it. Um, and you can actually see, oh, why it has the, the spikes it does. Um, when astronomers look at an image, they can immediately tell the design of the telescope based on the pattern of the star. And so this is kind of cool. You see the, the trusses there um, that align the telescope are reflected in this diffraction pattern. But then it was a couple months, I think it was uh, May 22nd, there was actually a micrometeorite that happened to go straight down and hit the, the mirror, one of the, the panels, and cause some damage. And so this, of course, put it out of alignment and is slightly decreased the sensitivity of the telescope. And, and everyone was really surprised because they expected something like this to happen, but not within the first few months of the mission. And so people got really worried. Is this going to happen a lot more? Uh, do we have to worry about this because this has the potential to damage the telescope? Fortunately, there were ways to sort of get around this. Um, no, sorry, I'll go. Back. Well, here we go. I have to go through this again. The ways to get around the micrometeorite impact um, are just not to point the telescope in the direction it's moving, right? If you imagine driving a car really fast and putting your head out the window, if you don't want bugs to splat in your face, you can turn your head to the side, things like that. And so now they try not to point the James Webb Space Telescope in the motion, in the direction of motion in its orbit. Um, fortunately, this is not a big thing. This hasn't happened since. So it was just kind of a fluke that this happened right at the start of the mission. Um, all right, so, so to tell you about that cool diffraction pattern, the star pattern, uh, this is just you know, why essentially you see the stars that you see. So if you had just a perfect circle, a light bucket coming in and you could detect it, you would, you would still see like these ripples from the bending of light around the edges of your circle. Um, light is a wave and it actually creates these interference patterns. Now, the James Webb Space Telescope has hexagonal mirrors, and so that creates kind of like the six-pointed star pattern, and it's actually broken into tiny tiled hexagons, and so that creates these interference patterns where it goes bright and dark and bright and dark. Um, there are gaps, right? The panels aren't exactly next to each other. There's little gaps so they can adjust them, and then there's the truss, the three support structures for the secondary mirror, so that also creates this. And so whenever you see like a, a star, a point of light, you see this cool pattern that tells you that's a James Webb Space Telescope image. Hubble had a little bit different design, right? It was more circular. And so Hubble, you see um, pictures of Hubble and you see four points um, because it's not, doesn't have that hexagonal pattern. All right. The James Webb Space Telescope has many cameras that do slightly different things. Um, they have what's called near cam, which is in the near infrared, and they have MIRI, which is in the mid infrared, which is at longer wavelengths. And so you can you can sort of see near cam and all the other instruments tend to show us what we think of as like stars and, and things like that. And when you look in the mid infrared, you start to see the gas and dust, and you see all these beautiful structures. Um, so they see slightly different things because they're looking at different wavelengths of light. Near spec over on the left, that's really cool. It's um, it will actually take infrared spectra, but it creates like a cube, so it's like a three dimensional image where you've got the two dimensions in the sky, but then the third uh, dimension is the wavelength of light. So you can step through the light 
and see where there are spectral lines and you can see what the different lines look like in their morphology in the sky. It's really cool. So not as high resolution as the cameras near Cam and Miri, but it tells you something really interesting about what's going on with stars and galaxies. Um, and then there's like a fine guidance uh, sensor and uh, there's another more traditional like split spectrometer. So there, there's lots of, of bells and whistles on it. Um, all of these instruments are now kind of out of date to astronomers because when you build a space telescope, you have to do this maybe a decade before it launches so that they can go through and test everything and make sure it's gonna survive in space with all these cosmic rays hitting it, all this radiation. And so today, you know, astronomers are building even more fantastic instruments that they want to put on the next space telescope. And for now, they're using on the ground. Um, but this is the largest telescope in space, and it gives us just unprecedented views. All right. So here is the first picture, right? This is a picture released by a presidential press conference, which I'd never heard of for astronomy before. Um, this is a beautiful image. And so this was released July 11th. Um, it's a cluster of galaxies. So you can see basically a few stars here with those cool six points. Uh, and then everything else is a galaxy. And some of these galaxies have really bizarre shapes. And what is actually going on is that there are galaxies behind galaxies. So there's a cluster of galaxies, all these kind of white fluffy galaxies, these big elliptical galaxies are incredibly massive. And there's even more mass there that we can't see in the form of dark matter. And all this gravity is actually bending space-time and the light that's passing through it gets bent like a funhouse mirror. So all these cool like swirls and things are the de deformation of space-time by the mass of those galaxies. And it actually almost acts like a, a magnifying glass. It magnifies the light coming from these really distant galaxies and allows us to see these really, really distant faint galaxies because they're amplified by what is almost acting like a, a telescope for, for the James Webb Space Telescope. So this, most of the galaxies you see here are about um, four and a half billion years away. So we're seeing them as they were about four and a half billion years ago. And you can see galaxies, just like stars, galaxies have all these colors, um, but galaxies have shapes and they're interacting and it, Fascinating stuff. Um, so they made this image public and then astronomers could look at it. And right away, um, they started discovering some things that people didn't know about. So like this little region here, I mean, it looks cool, but what's, what's super interesting about it? Uh, well, they call these the streamers. They look like little kind of streamers, uh, this like white wisp. Um, these three, what look like separate galaxies are all the same galaxy. We know that because we can look at the spectra of the galaxy and by seeing the spectra, it's like a fingerprint that tells us this galaxy is all the same. Um, and then if you look, it has these little dots around it. And astronomers think that these little dots are actually globular clusters around some kind of interacting disk galaxy. So this would be like a really, really old Milky Way, right? Our Milky Way galaxy, maybe 8 billion years ago. Um, and it has all these really massive globular clusters. So, I mean, this is the first time I've heard of, of seeing globular clusters from so far away in other galaxies. We can see them for the nearby galaxies, but I mean, this is fantastic. Um, there was a race as soon as this was put out by all these astronomers, everyone wanted to find what is the most distant galaxy, right? So because the universe is expanding, it shifts the wavelength of light and makes it redder. Um, this is like a Doppler shift, like the ambulance goes by, you hear the pitch change. Well, because it, the universe is expanding, it's like everything is racing away from us. And so these faintest, distant, reddest galaxies are some of the first galaxies to ever form. And what happens is their, their spectra, their characteristic fingerprints of hydrogen, oxygen, and other elements, they get moved from where we would see them in the lab to these longer infrared wavelengths of light. And you can measure that shift and tell how far away the galaxy is. And so they're finding galaxies that formed, you know, the universe is only 13.6 billion years old. So some of these galaxies are forming 500 million years after the Big Bang, which seems like a long time and is a long time, but on the scale of galaxies is like a snap of your fingers. 
um, to have these really massive galaxies just there at these early times was was kind of surprising. I mean, surprised me. I'm sure there were uh, some astronomers were like, this is exactly what I was expecting, but I certainly was not expecting this. Um, so this, you know, this just one image had all these cool things in it. Um, here's another beautiful image. So this was a galaxy that's only about 29 million light years from Earth. So it's one of the closer galaxies to us. And it looks kind of like we, how we think our Milky Way looks. And so this is zoomed in. You can see there's like a bulge of stars in the center that's kind of yellowish. And then you see these little bursts of stars. These are star clusters forming in the spiral arms. And there's these dark dust lanes. It's beautiful. Um, this is actually not the James Webb Space Telescope image. So if you want to see what Webb saw, um, here, I'll shift to the Webb image. This is what Webb sees. Oh, so much of the starlight disappears and is replaced by, like, it almost looks like a froth, right? This is all dust in the galaxy. And the dust has all these holes, right? All these pockets where massive stars have either gone supernova or had just insane winds that carve out and make it like Swiss cheese. And so uh, the, the dust clumps together and eventually that dust will cool down and form new clouds that might collapse and form stars. And so this is showing us like the process of star formation in this galaxy. You can see these kind of bright red smudges places and those are some of the youngest um, star forming regions. Those are brand new stars that have just been formed. It was really cool to see the, the process of star formation. In our galaxy, we have trouble seeing this because we're in all this muck. We have all this dust around that we have to look through and it makes it very hard to see, and except for certain cases like the Orion Nebula, things that are very close to us. Can I say something um, super quick? I just wanna say they were brand new stars 29 million years ago, right? <laughs> Light years, 29 million light years ago. So 29 can million years ago, yeah. And when I say brand new, you, I mean only a few million years old. Because <laughs> that's young you for a zoom, star. Can you zoom into the center of it? I'm sorry. Uh, sure, I can, I can try. Let's see here. Let's see. Uh, It gets blurry, <laughs> but oh, there, this would be sad. kind of the center of the galaxy. Um, it's not, it's not that distinct because there's still a lot of star formation. Yeah. Oh no, it's fabulous. Thank you. I'm sorry. I won't interrupt again. This just gets me so excited. Thank you. Yeah. No, please interrupt with questions. Or we can just sit and look at the pictures. They're so beautiful. Um, we zoomed in on one of the star forming regions. So like a little tiny red dot in that last image is what this looks like in our own galaxy. This is the Carina Nebula, which has been photographed by many, many people. It's, it's really in the Southern hemisphere. So it's not something that like we typically look at. Um, but the scale of this, this is about only 7,500 light years from Earth. <laughs> so very close. Um, and you see there's massive stars kind of up top. And those massive stars are, oh, they're, they're all, maybe a million times brighter than the sun. And their light is just carving up the dust and gas that was forming stars. And so you see that dust and gas being pushed away by light and kind of excavated. And so you see these fingers where there were dense clumps forming new stars. Um, and some places you can see, oh, let me zoom out. There, you can even see like new stars that have, have created shocks. They have like outflows and they shoot out jets as mat matter falls into onto the star. And so they carve out little places. Um, just to give you a sense of scale here. So they, they call these like the cliffs of Carina just to be evocative, right? But the size of what would be like a cliff here in this image, these pillars of dust, maybe seven light years across. Um, you know, our, our distance to the sun is like eight light minutes. <laughs> the closest stars are about a few light years. Um, these things, these are huge structures. 
And so this is a, you know, unprecedented view of like how stars form. We think stars form all in clusters and out of all this rich gas and dust that eventually they just either gobble up or completely blow away due to the, the massive stars. All right, so, um, you know, I'm an astronomer. I love stars, I love galaxies. Um, I'm not really a planetary science, but I love, oh, okay, sorry, I, I love planets. So next I have a picture of a planet, but I, there's a really great question from Mark about, um, since you're only seeing infrared light, how are you seeing the colors? And so uh, if you look, NASA put out like posters of these and they have usually at the bottom, they'll say what wavelength corresponds to red and what wavelength of the infrared light have we mapped into our visible light? So what they do is when you take an image with the James Webb Space Telescope, you get a black and white image that's only one filter in the infrared, only one set of wavelengths. And then you reconstruct what you, you know, you can map like the furthest red color, it's, it's infrared, but you know, the longest wavelength color becomes red. The shortest wavelength color, even though it's much redder than red, we're gonna call it blue so that we can see it. And so that's what this shows here. When you see all these colors, people are choosing like a map, a color map to bring out different features. And they do this all the time, all, all wavelengths. We have so many great telescopes from the radio wavelengths to X-rays and gamma rays. And to try to make it like understandable, we map it to our own very limited visible range. All right, does anyone know what this planet is? The Jupiter? Yeah, you can see the, the spot, right? There's the yeah, great red spot that's what there. I thought. And so they've done something similar here where they took, um, looks like 3.6 microns and made that red, two microns and made it like yellow green, and then 1.5 microns and made that sort of cyan blue. And uh, there's a little star there, which is not a star. And you can see a little bit of Jupiter's ring. Jupiter's ring is not something that we usually see in the night sky with a telescope, but it's it's something that was known about, is well known about and, and studied by missions to Jupiter. Um, and there's actually, it's not in the image, but Io is really bright. Io is the closest of the four Galilean moons. You can see it through a telescope, even, you know, the, the cheapest telescope you can get, a pair of binoculars, you can see the Galilean moons. And so Io um, actually comes close enough and has these volcanic eruptions that Jupiter actually pulls off and it can actually lead to aurora going around Jupiter. And so the aurora and Jupiter in the infrared are so bright that they pop out in this image and actually cause their own like diffraction spikes, almost like they're as bright as stars. Um, I have another beautiful planet, if you want to see that. Do you know what planet this is? The way you ask that, it's not Saturn. <laughs> yes, it is not Saturn. Uranus? It's actually Neptune. Hmm. Yeah, and so Neptune has a ring, or a series of rings. You can see the gaps in the rings there. Um, this is the best image we've taken of Neptune since uh, 1989, when Voyager 2 flew by it. And you can see there's this really bright star, like it looks like a star, right? It's a point source. It is actually brighter than Neptune. It is not a star. It is Triton, the moon of Neptune. So Neptune has this really rich methane atmosphere and methane is really great as a greenhouse gas. Right, this is one of our problems. Uh, Neptune has a lot of methane, will absorb in the infrared. Um, Triton is covered in ice. And so it's reflecting all of the sun's infrared light back at us. And so Triton is actually brighter at these wavelengths than the entire planet of Neptune. It's amazing. And then you can see all these tiny moons that pop out in the infrared. Oh, okay. So my favorite thing to look at with, with infrared space telescopes is uh, star forming regions. So I had another one. This is called the Tarantula Nebula. And so this is another thing, like all the best star forming regions, except for Orion, I feel like are in the Southern hemisphere. Um, this is part of the, the oh, I don't wanna get it wrong. It's the, it's the large Magellanic Cloud, I believe. It's the larger, the small. 
I know there's some people from Nephis here. You can feel free to correct me. But um, this is in a galaxy that orbits. It's a, it's a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way that orbits our own. And so this uh, is about 50,000, or sorry, it would be 150,000 light years away. And these satellite galaxies orbit the Milky Way kind of like comets would orbit the sun. So they get closer, but then they go far away and then they come back. And when they're close, there's tidal forces that take the gas and they stretch and squeeze it. And the gas crashes into each other and forms stars. It pumps up the density. And so there was these bursts of recent star formation in these satellite galaxies because they've just passed by the Milky Way. And so you can see these, these all these cool stars forming um, and this new cluster here, all those bluish stars, which of course is infrared light. So we're not actually seeing the blue light, but they are they are massive stars. If you saw them with an optical telescope, they would be blue. They're carving out with their light this bubble inside this nebula. And you can see all the gas and dust kind of lit up by their energy and then carved out by the also their winds and the, just their light. They massive stars tend to be very windy. They're so bright, they blow, basically blow the outer atmospheres off of themselves. Um see so this one i also think has a nice uh, example of one of the other instruments so this is near spec and i've kind of superimposed it on here it has these like i don't know psychedelic colors um and you can see when you look at these other colors you can start to see things that were invisible before these kind of like filamentary structures in blue and so these are dark in the image but they pop out if you look at certain wavelengths of light, I think this is oxygen that we might be looking at. Um, and so you can see these structures that are only visible in certain elements. Um, and so this is a three-dimensional cube here that you can actually get all this cool spectral information about. So you can diagnose the um, properties of the gas. So in the infrared, if something is thermal, um, Usually it's brightness, the brighter it is, it's generally true the hotter it is, but that is not always true. Um, there are other effects that could cause things to be brighter or fainter. But generally, yeah, if you think about thermal radiation, the brighter something is, the hotter it is in its spectrum. So the, the redder gas tends to be cooler or denser. Um, and here is that kind of spectral cube. So you can pull out like different states of hydrogen, uh, hydrocarbon dust, and you can study all these things about this one particular region. I think this uh, that they've shown here is a massive star that has a shell around it of dust. And so it's, it's just amazing the amount of information you can get from, from this. Um, if you are an amateur astronomer, if you ever get to look through a telescope, some of the most beautiful things you can look at are planetary nebula. Total misnomer it has nothing to do with planets. It's just that they're kind of like resolved. And so um, what you're seeing here is sort of the fate of our, our sun. Uh, after a star, roughly the mass of our sun evolves and kind of ends its life, the outer layers of the star lift off and it reveals the hot core of the star that might be 10 million degrees Kelvin. And so it's just irradiating the surrounding outer layers. And as that lifts off, it creates this beautiful nebula that's really bright in emission lines. And it also, you can see the dust from, from the star that's been created. And I think Carl Sagan said, we are all stardust or star stuff. Uh, and this is the dust, the star stuff, right? The dust contains a lot of that stuff that eventually goes out and disperses into the galaxy and over billions of years recombines and forms new stars and planets. The image on the left, I think is the, let's see, I have it in my notes, near spec, I think, or sorry, near cam. And the one on the right, I think is Miri. And so you're seeing like the different wavelength ranges telling you different information. Um, this is, I thought it was a really cool image. Someone showed me this and I was like, hmm, is something wrong with the telescope? Um, there was another astronomer visiting who studied uh, massive stars. And so this is actually uh, one of the most massive stars that we know of in our galaxy. It's called a Wolf-Rayet star and it's 
it's so massive it's literally blowing the outer layers uh, off and it does this periodically so there's actually two stars in a binary system here they're so close together they look like one star and periodically they just have these mass loss um, events where it, a whole bunch of the star's mass just gets thrown off and lifts off in what sort of looks like a, a shell and so you see all these repeating ripples of dust that's formed from the cooling outer layers of those stars that have been lifted off and they're just sort of floating off into space. Um, what else? Oh, this is one of my favorites. This is um, a molecular cloud in our galaxy. And it's just beautiful. This is a, a cloud that's kind of earlier on in its star formation process. And you just see these sheets of gas that we're looking through, gas and dust. And they do, they look just like clouds, but you know, really different environment. Um, on the right there, you can sort of see this little uh, trailing, it looks like a little nebula right there, or um, I don't know, like a little fish swimming. And there's all these, these are massive stars that are forming where there's coons that are blowing away. All right, how many more do I have time for? I guess I have about 10, five more minutes. You take as much time as you need. We're good. There have been a lot of great images. <laughs> this, is, um, this is a zoom in of a star forming. So if you think about how did our sun form, it would have looked something like this, um, maybe four and a half billion years ago. What you can see in the center, you can't see the star forming. It's not yet a star, but it's it's a big, dense ball of gas that just hasn't quite ignited and start fusing hydrogen into helium. And you see this little dust lane going across it. And that is um, the protostellar disk. All of the mass is falling into a disk. It's kind of like, um, like an ice skater pulling their arms in. You take a big spherical cloud of gas, but it's rotating very slowly as it pulls in, it speeds up and it becomes like a pizza. And slowly that gas from the disc falls into the star and whatever doesn't make it onto the star is left over and fragments and forms planets. And so what you're seeing is this protostar, which is still incredibly hot, blowing out um, gas and dust from basically the ends and then there's a little skirt of the protostellar disk that's condensing down and material still falling onto the star. All right, back to galaxies. Uh, this is called Stefan's Quintet. And so there's four four galaxies here that are interacting. There's five galaxies, but one of them is just happens to be in the way. Uh, it's actually the one on the left there. That one just happens to be there. It's a spiral galaxy that's in our way from seeing what is otherwise uh, four galaxies merging together. And so as they come, they basically crash into each other. The stars don't crash. There's so much space between stars. But all the gas and dust in the galaxies crashes into each other. And you can see like there's a little bit of green in there. That's shocks from the gas hitting each other. Um, it heats up the gas, but it causes it to become more dense, which allows it to cool down and form stars. And so this is, you know, a, a region that's been studied many, many times before. You can see beautiful Hubble images. Um, but what's really interesting is the green. There's this huge shock wave that is like a trail of gas from the different galaxies from after they cla clashed with each other. And we knew it was there from previous like infrared space telescope images, but we didn't really see the structure. And so now like with this image, you, you see like exactly all the fragmentation and all kinds of great stuff. Um, how far away are these? Only about 290 million light years away. So as galaxies go, this is not terribly far. Um, and then that, that other one on the left is only about 40 million light years away, which is quite close as galaxies go. Um, oh, and then there's a, a supermassive black hole. You can see there's like a red spot there. It almost looks like a star. That's not actually a star. 
that's a supermassive black hole. So it's about um, 24 million times the mass of our sun. And it's captured some gas and maybe even some stars from the interaction between these galaxies. And it's eating that gas, right? Eating is not really, but what happens is it has this huge gravity. And as the gas approaches it, it really heats up and forms these, um, this accretion disk and these jets, kind of like what we're seeing with the protoplanetary disk, but way, way, way more energetic. And so uh, this supermassive black hole is shining this incredibly bright light because the gas there is emitting in x-rays. It's millions of degrees because it's being you know, squished by the tidal forces of the supermassive black hole. So there's all kinds of great, great things you can get from studying these, the details in these images. And astronomers also do um, very detailed simulations to try to explain like what interaction was going on here. Oh, there's another great uh, interacting galaxy I, I wanna show you. This is called the Cartwheel Galaxy because it looks kind of like a cartwheel, right? Um, so there was a collision like you might see from Stefan's Quintet, but it was about 4 million, 400 million years ago. And so what happened is a smaller galaxy came in and hit this kind of spiral galaxy in the center, but that galaxy was um, distorted and, and basically shot out to the edges. So you see like the wheel is that tidally disrupted galaxy and there's like spokes coming from it. And you see at the edges where it gets red and there's these dark dust lanes. So this is, you know, one that just happened to create this beautiful structure through the galaxy interaction. And right at the edge, that's all going to collapse and form stars. And it already is starting. You can see the little patches of blue where um, there's all these really massive stars that have just formed. Um, eventually, everything's going to settle down. And this will probably be... Uh, something that's somewhere between a spiral and an elliptical galaxy, right? more spiral, so some kind of lenticular galaxy. So it'll have a structure. Um, and this is how we think galaxies grow is through these interactions. We see this in our own Milky Way. You see evidence for like collisions with much smaller things, um, much smaller galaxies like accreting onto our own Milky Way. But in about 3 billion years or so, uh, Milky Way and Andromeda are actually going to collide and form some like huge galaxy collision. That would be amazing to see. I saw I missed a question in the chat window about the supermassive black hole. Um, yeah, so we have a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy that's incredibly boring compared to these other supermassive black holes. Uh, so black holes are black, but if matter gets close to them, they have tidal forces, right? There's a lot of energy released in as you approach the black hole, just from losing that gravitational potential energy that the matter heats up and emits really strongly in light. And in some cases, right, that matter can be squeezed so much as like you're squeezing a tu tube of toothpaste and you have jets that shoot out from, from the black hole. So this is all outside of the event horizon. Nothing escapes from inside the black hole, but not everything falls into the black hole. And yeah, probably in, I don't know, it'll take a few hundred million years in Stefan's Quintet. Eventually that black hole will calm down because there won't be as much gas around it to cause the, the activity that we're seeing. All right, um, let's see. Okay, I'll do one more here. I'll skip Trico. That's, oh, I should go back. Okay, we'll do two more. Orion, because we can see Orion, right? We can see it with our own eyes through a telescope. It's beautiful. It's so much fun to look at. Um, there's an image with the James Webb Space Telescope, and you just really see all that gas and dust just beautifully. Um, so much is going on in Orion. And there's this um, really embedded massive star. There's gas swirling down in the bottom center there. The brightest star is just circled with gas and dust that it's carving out. Um, and then if you look, you see all these like little newly formed massive stars, or maybe they're not yet stars uh, that create these little cocoons and have little disks where planets are still forming. So it's great to, to be able to study. You get to see all the stages of star formation because every star or protostar is at a slightly different point in its life. So you can kind of compare them and get a, a sense for how star formation proceeds. 
And then the last one I wanted to show you was Pandora's cluster, because this is this is my background. This is the one that just came out. Um, and you can see this is not as impressive as the very first image, the, the other galaxy cluster. Uh, it's not quite the same lensing thing, but it's beautiful. It's per perhaps the one of the most massive clusters of galaxies that we know about where it's near to us. So you can see four little groups of these elliptical, you know, these fuzzy galaxies that are merging together to form one galaxy cluster. And um, you can see how they're lensing background galaxies really beautifully, right? So there's, especially on the bottom right here, all those streaks around those galaxies, those Einstein rings is what they're called, where the light is passing through curved space time. And so it's bent. And um, yeah, it's just beautiful. This is about 4 billion light years from Earth. So quite far away, but incredibly beautiful. All right, I think I'll stop there. And if anyone has questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. If you have a question, please um, use the reaction button so we can see your hand um, on, on the on the screen uh, rather than try to see everybody in the room. We can't see everybody in the room. So the reaction button, if you're not familiar with it, is at the bottom of your screen. You click on the reactions and you'll see a couple of uh, emojis like what David has right now. Let's go to David. OK, uh, I apologize for my cameras going nuts. I was not too distracting. but. Uh... Anyway, all that was just amazing. This is exactly what I was hoping you were going to do, Jack. <laughs> um, I, I have a couple of questions. I'm just going to ask two now. At one point early on, you mentioned that some of the, the visuals that we were seeing was caused by light from stars pushing dust. How does light react with material stuff to actually move it. It seems like light isn't the kind of thing that can move things. Uh, the other question I had is you showed us a star. Uh, it's not yet a star. It's in the process of forming. Uh, and you talked about that, which was interesting. But where do the planets come from? How do they fit into that picture? So I'm going to stop there. So um, yeah, light, it's amazing to think that like when you go out in the, you're on the beach and the sun's shining down on you, the light from the sun is actually pushing a little bit on you. Um, it's so tiny. It's really like infinitesimal, but um, you know, it, light has energy and so it has momentum. And when it bounces off you or when you absorb light, you actually get pushed a little bit by the light. It's so small that we would never detect it on Earth, except right in space. Um, you know, you're in microgravity or very low gravitational fields, or you're just freely floating. There's no other forces except the gravitational force. Now the sunlight is actually pushing you a little bit. Um, and then you asked about where are the planets in this image? So yeah, the planets are somewhere in that dark disk. We can't see them. Mm. They're very, very tiny and they probably haven't formed yet. Like it's still too dusty. There, there may be some planetesimals, but I think it's too early on. Um, I was just doing this uh, fun outreach activity with like first graders and you take Play-Doh and you stick it together to make a, a scale solar system, right? And you need, if you take one jar of Play-Doh, you can make all the planets in our solar system. Like Earth ends up being about 10 millimeters across, uh, except for J Jupiter and Saturn, right? To make Jupiter and Saturn, you need 30 more cans of Play-Doh. <laughs> and to make the sun, right? The sun is like the size of a couple people, right? So I just get all the first graders together. That's the sun. <laughs> and then you've got the planets. So planets are really, really tiny amount of, of matter. They're, they're really just the breadcrumbs left over from stars. How young were you when you first got involved in astronomy or when it first piqued your interest? I was always a little bit interested in astronomy, but always really into black holes. And Stephen Hawking was like really inspiring to me. And um, the first time I really looked through a telescope and felt like that was my telescope, I really enjoyed it, was as a freshman in college. Uh, our campus had an observatory, and so I got to go there and see Saturn and, and Mars. I'd always lived in cities, right? So I didn't really think I would see much, um, and I didn't realize how wrong I was. So that, that really got me into astronomy. 
Um, not seeing anybody's hand with the emoji, um, I have several questions, but uh, I'll stop when somebody has another question that they would like to ask. Um, what's the life expectancy of the Webb telescope? That's a great question. So they designed it to be at least five years. Um, I think, you know, at least 10 years is more reasonable, um, but hopefully even longer than that. There aren't too many things that can be consumed on the telescope. There are a few, uh, there's a little bit of coolant. Uh, to cool down certain instruments like the spectrometers. But generally, I think you could keep using the telescope, especially in, in the near infrared where we see most of the beautiful pictures, um, as long as we can keep it you know, powered up and undamaged. So hopefully like the Hubble has gone for 30 years and is still going. Now Hubble needed several repairs uh, and there's no real plans to do that with the James Webb Space Telescope. It's not something we have the capability of doing. Um, but basically until it breaks, astro astronomers will keep using it. It will be an amazing tool. So hopefully, I mean, I would love to, you know, just have it last my entire career in astronomy <laughs> would be great. The unmute is usually down to the left. Hi, I'm sorry. Did you or, call or on you me? Can unmute. No. Oh, we're, sorry. We're waiting for Richard Eason. <laughs> okay. Oh, so, sorry. Yeah, you were you're the garble. Um, yeah. Does this does the, does the does the web have any capacity to, you know, explore what what dark matter and dark energy actually are, or is that something it's not designed for? So yeah, finding dark matter and dark energy are like two of the biggest questions in astronomy. Um, let's see, I'll go back to the galaxy cluster. Uh, all right, so one way to find dark matter is to look at these gravitational lenses um, where the galaxy is, is lensed in the background, you know, recreating that, um, fitting that image you can fit the mass distribution. And so you can understand where is the dark matter around these galaxies. Uh, so that really can help us understand like how dark matter is structured, but it still doesn't really tell us what dark matter is. And so it's very unlikely that uh, the web will tell us something like completely new about dark matter. Um, you know, it'll certainly help us characterize and understand how dark matter is working in the universe, but it's not probably gonna tell us what dark matter is. Um, maybe it'll work with other missions, like in other wavelengths, maybe dark matter, which doesn't interact with light. If it's a particle, it could interact with itself and form other particles that do interact with light and decay and maybe emit like gamma rays or x-rays. And so if we found like a weird x-ray or gamma ray source, which has happened all the time, doesn't make the news, <laughs> but um, you want to follow it up with things like the James Webb Space Telescope to understand if there is dark matter there and, and characterize things. So it's really kind of working in collaboration. Uh, dark energy, though, we may get some interesting results. Um, dark energy is measured, basically, there's some energy powering the expansion of space and we don't know what it is. Um, we still really need to characterize it because dark energy is relatively new in the age of our universe. It only showed up like 3 billion, 4 billion years ago. And so we would like to understand like how it's evolving. And you do that by looking at really distant supernovae, which if we can get them with the James Webb Space Telescope would be fantastic. And so there are programs to try to do that. So it could tell us something really interesting about dark energy. Thank you. Okay, let's go to Kay Reach, then Ra, and then David Schwambert. Kay Reach. Yes, hello. Um, you had mentioned that a smaller galaxy had been distorted by a larger one. and. My 11 year old here is wondering what happens when two big galaxies collide? Um, I should I should be clear, like the galaxy that got shredded into the spokes and the wheel was not like super minor. Um, you can actually see, are there? Yeah, not, not really there. There's a little tail coming off of this galaxy. These tidal tails are telling you that there was some other galaxy that basically got shredded out and is falling onto that galaxy. So that would be like a little galaxy. Um, if you see really big galaxies interact, you'd basically have Stefan's Quintet, right? This beautiful image of galaxies crashing into each other. Okay. Thank you. Ra. Thank you, Ra. 
Hey, how's it going? Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Hewitt. Um, really fascinating stuff. Uh, my question is, as far as, um, it seems trivial, but like the space and seeing so many different electromagnetic wave radiation and all these lights, how does the, when you all are looking so far back or these, this light traveling billions of light years away, how are you able to differentiate like relatively close, like infrared light versus light that's been traveling billions of years so that, and then being able to like create these images from it, like how it's, it seems like there's so much stuff going on in space. How do you differentiate that? I mean, it's taken over a century of astronomers piecing together these puzzles, right? Like this is a huge undertaking that builds on all the previous knowledge. So like when I tell you, oh, this is Stefan's Quintet, right? And like, we know it's these things. Uh, when they first saw this, they did not know what it was. <laughs> like, it kind of looks like the idea of a galaxy not being our entire universe, but there being all these satellite galaxies, that's only around a hundred years old. So um, it, finding the distances to these things, it's, it's a huge scope of work that uses not just one telescope, but all these different telescopes and all these different researchers. So there's a lot of publications and articles and research that's done um, that how we figure these things out. It's not at all trivial to like look at an image and be mm -hmm. like, oh, I know exactly what's going on. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank okay. you. What's great too is that these images are all public. So you can go and download them if you want and you can like look at them and try to figure out what's going on too. <laughs> a couple of questions in the uh, chat room. One question is, do you ever question what you're seeing? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I, I haven't had a James Webb image or like a project yet. So I haven't gotten like brand new, no one's ever seen this before, but I've done that with other telescopes. And when you first see it, there's always a couple things where you're like, I don't really know what that is. <laughs> I have to think about that. And so you'll go and you'll like see, okay, where other telescopes looking here, like maybe there's a tiny galaxy far away that could be in my image or you know, I have to think about what's really going on here. Um, it's, it's always a puzzle. And yeah, I mean, the expansion of the universe, it's mind blowing. Like the, set, the scale of the universe, the, the story of astronomy is people never appreciate how mind meltingly large the universe is. And it was always a failure of imagination that astronomers like came to some new discovery when someone thought maybe the universe is bigger, right? So. Um, all right. You you want to take a shot at explaining for in terms of boiling it down if we were in the elevator together what would you say to us what's dark matter i kind of took my shot <laughs> um i could try it again uh if you look at all the stuff in the universe, <laughs> okay. the, yeah 95 percent of the universe is not the stuff we're made out of our everyday experience. It's not light, it's not matter. About 25% of it is dark matter. It's some, we think it's a particle that doesn't interact with light. We have no idea what that particle is. I mean, we have lots of ideas. No one actually has proven what it is. It has gravity and it seems to be all around us. Um, dark energy is even more baffling because we really don't have a clue as to what it is, but something is causing the universe to accelerate, to basically like blow up but it's empty space. It's not like galaxies. The galaxies are all stuck together, but some for some reason, they all seem to be racing apart from each other faster and faster and faster. And yeah, it's a, one of the great mysteries keeps us in business. Mm -hmm. um, let's go back to Richard Eason. Richard. Yeah, is it, um, I know there are theories that, uh, you know, there was the Big Bang and that the uh, universe has continued to expand. Uh, and I guess there's a view on, among some people that we're basically destined to entropy, meaning, you know, the universe will continue to expand until basically, you know, it's many, many, many miles or light years, or whatever, between even an atom. Um, and because there will be no, everything will be formless. Um, what's your view on that, uh, that view? Yeah, like the heat death of the universe. Um, right. That's exactly what the laws of physics that we know about tell us. But there's so much physics we don't know. I would not like 
put a lot of money, well, it doesn't matter what I put money on or not, but yeah, who knows what's gonna happen on those ranges of timescales. Um, there's probably stuff that's gonna happen that we haven't even learned about yet. There's always more physics to be discovered when you go to these incredible scales. So we'll see, or we won't see, but maybe <laughs> we'll discover something else that's going on that might change that view of how we think the universe will end. Sometimes I feel that humans are like the flatlanders and we're only seeing you know, perhaps one or two dimensions of a very complex issue and it'll take us, you know, maybe we will never reach that point of understanding with a higher level of complexity. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Let's go to David Schrombert. Uh, um, again, I got 98 questions. Um, uh, <laughs> first thing I was gonna say is, um, Somebody had asked you about how long do you think the uh, James Webb telescope is going to be able to provide information. And the first thing I thought about were Voyager, which have been going for 45 years. And I think we're still in communication with at least one of them, aren't we? And I don't know if, if I, I, they're not telescopes, obviously, but uh, you know, it seems like that could give a little hope that uh, that things could last a little bit longer. Uh, what I really wanted to ask, uh, and this might be going somewhere you don't want to go, but um, I have been listening to a lot of lectures online about uh, uh, the multiverse and things like that. And a lot of it sort of doesn't make sense to me. But the, the explanation that seems to make the most sense to me is that, for example, the Big Bang uh, people are always asking, was there something before the Big Bang? Yes, there was. No, there wasn't or whatever. Um, but some of the people who talk about multiverses or talk about the Big Bang say that what they're really talking about is that our galaxy, or not galaxy, our universe that we call it the universe that started with the Big Bang, it's actually a universe, what we call a universe, that started in one particular spot in a much, much larger universe, that there might be big bangs going on all the time, creating other things that, if we were able to look at them, would look similar to our universe. And that's that's the explanation that seems to make the most sense to me. Does Do you have any opinions on that? Do you uh, well, know about that theory? Yes, um, this idea of inflation, which seems to make sense and solve a lot of problems, but it hasn't, we don't have proof of it yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do think, so when astronomers look at galaxy surveys, they look and they see the universe, it basically becomes homogeneous. It looks the same everywhere on scales larger than 100 million light years. And we can't see too much beyond that, right? The, the universe is only about 14 billion years old, so we can only see back in time. Our little radius of light where we can see the universe is only about 14 billion years out. The universe looks entirely like flat in four dimensional space, and it looks uniform. And clearly like it could just be that forever beyond where we can see, or it could start to change. And we really have very limited ways of knowing. And so the, you know, people much smarter than I are trying to think of ways where you could see the universe beyond how far light can travel. Um, and it's, there are lots of ideas, but it's, it's really a difficult challenge and maybe impossible. Yeah. Thank you. Can you uh, um, talk a little bit about I mean, first of all, this is fantastic. The images are, are wonderful and they really are something that, you know, draw, would draw somebody who is a physicist, an astrophysicist, a, an astronomer in to look at ever get back about practical seeing and how the humans who are walking around, uh, let's say, New Jersey. Ken, you broke up really bad. I, I didn't hardly catch any of your question. Uh, really? Okay, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize that. Um, I'm trying to get to the point. I don't know how I'm coming across, uh, but I'm trying to get to the point of practical applications of what we're learning 
in relative to the humans walking around Earth. I'm going to put it in the chat room. Yeah, that's a good question. Did, did I come across? I, I don't know. I, sorry, I didn't quite get the questions. So if you could try again and put it in the chat. I'm going to put it in the cha chat. Can you explain practical applications of what we are learning for the humans walking about Earth? I mean, I don't try to sell astronomy as terribly practical. <laughs> it's like <laughs> great art or humanities. Um, it's one of those human accomplishments that we'll always think back, oh, who was the person that did that? But um, yeah, when you sell it in a proposal, the practicalness of astronomy is that I think it gets people excited and it gets them to maybe get over if they have a fear of math or be interested in computer science. Um, like there's all these tools that I, are very practical that I use, um, but I just don't use them in a very practical way. So I'm very privileged to be able to do that. And I feel like, you know, you have to share that with everyone since we're all essentially funding this amazing endeavor. Okay, um, let's, let's go to Angie. Sure. Angie. Hey, you... I have a question. I would love to come to the UNF uh, meeting. And you said it's this Friday, but um, I'm a little confused because the link says that it's actually um, on the 3rd of February and the 3rd of March. Yes, so there is, I just found out today, there was another speaker coming in for chemistry seminar and he wanted to do an outreach talk. So we just scheduled a new astronomy. It hasn't been put on the web page yet. Oh, um, okay. We're the first people to know about it. Oh, okay, great. So it's not listed there at all. It should be like tonight. Friday. Yeah, okay, later whenever, on whenever Jason gets around to updating the web page. I see on the third, you were the guest speaker, right? Yes, I basically did this talk. Yeah. <laughs> so, so on this Friday, you won't be talking, but you'll be there. No, there's going to be another. Uh, I should okay. look up his name. Um, yeah, another speaker. I'll be there to help with the telescopes. Oh, and if nice. you have any questions, you're welcome to bring them then, to me then. And then, yeah. what about um, parking? Because I know that they're crazy with the parking at UNF. That's uh, the arena lot. So right arena by the lot? arena, you okay. can park there. It's free okay. after five on Fridays. So. Oh, you, super. You're great. All right, we'll see you there. Thank you very much. All out. And I only have like a couple minutes left because I did promise my daughter I'd go tuck her in. So I okay. can do a couple more minutes and then I have to go. All right. Let, well, let's see if there's any other questions. We've got um, Ra has another question. And then maybe we'll take one more after Ra if there is another one. And then we'll wrap it up. Uh, Ra. Ra. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah. I was wondering, uh, Doctor here, do you have any insight on the particular reason why the um, telescope kind of have these? Um, it's shaped in a hexagonal way. Like, what's what's the significance or what's the advantage? I would say um, of like having it shaped in such a way, um, and it's like you know getting these images and kind of absorbing these different light ways. Like, what's is there any significance of the shape? Yeah, it's, it's essentially an engineering decision. Um, uh, they're engineered to, to be able to be folded up. I, I don't think I had, uh, no, I, yeah, sorry. I don't have the, the image where you can see them folded up, but uh, essentially this all had to fold together to fit inside the rocket to be launched. And so uh, the hexagonal tiles essentially are, are nice because you can make these straight edges fit together really well and limit the distortions. If you have circular ones, like break it down into circles, then you've got gaps in the, the mirror. Yeah. And I guess my follow up question was as far as I know, I guess the James Webb, this telescope is kind of like the next iteration or next advancement of um, just space, like the imagery that we'll probably get in, along with several other things. Like, what do you think, as far as practicality, um, the things that is going to be the probably the most under most important underlying advancements, probably not even within astronomy itself, that's gonna help us probably see the next 
evolution of you could like think about the like try to take a peek in the future of like what's going to be important to ABC and another version or another advancement of how clear we can see things or how much further we can see things things of that nature. If that makes sense. I think so. I mean, I'm very down the rabbit hole of astronomy. So I, outside of astronomy, <laughs> I'm probably not your best prognosticator. Um, but there are so many like things that I'm excited about, like other than the James Webb Space Telescope, there are all these great like plans to build gravitational wave observatories in space mm. and to find out more about that. Um, there's all kinds of like, I'm, I'm really interested in cosmic rays and gamma rays. So there's like mm -hmm. new gamma ray telescopes. They're talking about X-ray telescopes. I mean, you know, there was the Event Horizon Telescope that imaged oh, the, wow. just around black holes. We have pictures of black holes. So, um, yeah, there's all kinds of great stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, last last yeah, call one more question, question, and I really have to go. Sorry. Okay. Um, anybody? It, see, see, Angie, your hand is still up, so I'm assuming you just haven't put it down yet. Is that true? Uh, if if it is, you can. Let me put that down. Okay. Well, um, let's uh, give a nice round of applause to Dr. Jack Hewitt. We very much appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And um, do you read uh, "Good Night Moon" to your daughter? <laughs> Been a few no, no, years, no. but yeah, we did that long ago. Yeah. <laughs> Good one. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Hewitt. I appreciate it. Um, we'll say good night here and we can end the meeting. I appreciate everybody's attendance. Uh, check, check our website for a few speakers. We meet generally the third mo Monday of the month um, around 6.15, the doors open and uh, coming our way uh, during the year. So I appreciate everybody's attendance. Get home safely. <laughs> Outstanding, outstanding, outstanding. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. Okay. Good night.